Wow, thank you so much, Cristela. Thank you so much for welcoming, welcoming us into the space this morning. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're all really excited to have Cristela Litras and Dr. Romy Smith with us today. Um, yes, big, uh, I see some uh, hand claps in the in the people clapping. Um, we're all very happy from CDARE, which is comprised of Marie Louise Wild, uh, Marie Louise Crawley, and Sarah Watley to welcome and host today's Lab Day. Um, for those of you that are new to the Weave Lab Days, um, these are parts of the Weave project, which is co-financed by the European Union under the CEF which is the Connecting Europe Facility Program. The project aims to enrich Europeana with tangible cultural heritage content and to develop new tools. In response to one of our central questions, what open and reusable digital tools can be developed for working with cultural heritage content? Coventry University team, along with the wider um, Weave team, We've been tasked with building up um, and running different lab days, and these lab days bring together experts, um, artists, uh, researchers, and various people with a number of different uh, yeah, expertise and abilities to come in and look at some of these questions that we've been asking ourselves within the project. And for that, we are using this methodological framework called the Weave Lab Days. Um, Alex uh, Stan, who is also in the space, will be presenting in a few minutes the project in a kind of more broader sense. Um, and then we'll also hear from um, John Balian from Top Photos, who will also frame um, the work with the residency that happened with uh, the brilliant Dr. Romy Smith and Cristela. So before we go into and kind of jump into the rest of the day, I would like to remind everyone that we are in a digital space, um, but we still hope that you engage with us and feel free to turn your cameras on. Um, please do use the chat function or the Twitter. Feel free to drop in your name or where you're from, what organization you represent, or any questions you might have into the chat. Um, so that we can, yeah, engage and learn who's in the space. This is really about an exchange. Um, there's been a lot of uh, conversations before the day, but also we're responding to the space and to the, the people in the space. This is a slightly longer lab day that's um, going to be divided into two parts. The first part is a, a critical talk and response to and we'll get a better understanding of the residency that Rami and Cristela were part of um, that was linked to Top Photo. And the second part allows us this opportunity to really kind of be, you know, get into the mind uh, of what it's like in, in that process with Rami um, and, and Cristela. And so that will allow us to actually do some some writing. And, and yeah, so do feel free to stay for the whole day. Um, I will say uh, we try to be as inclusive and as accessible as possible for those who would benefit or would like an audio description. My name is Rosa Cisneros. I'm a female sitting in a white chair. I'm wearing a pattern dress with, um, I'm olive skin toned. My dark black hair is pulled up and I'm sitting in front of a burgundy wall. If anyone has any questions or would like to, or having any trouble or can't, um, yeah, please do reach out to myself or anyone in the Weave team. Kozer Hussein is running kind of our tech guru behind the scenes, so she would be a great person to contact, but anyone with myself or Marie Louise or anyone on the team would be happy to support um, those requests. Um, yes, I just wanted to say before we go over into Alex and I introduce Alex Don from IN2, um, I want a quick poll just to get a sense of who's in the space. Um, and just so, yeah, we can, uh, here we go. Here's our poll. 
Um, the first question is, how many people are aware of Europeana? The second question is, is there a digital archive you have used in the past? You can use the chat to answer. So you can say yes or no, or, you know, actually name that archive. And notice I said digital archive. And the third question, have you written a response to archives before? If you want to use the chat also to expand on that, please do feel free. Number four, have you created a performance response to archival material? So we have four questions there. Give you another minute. Okay, so some people said yes to our to Europeana. Some people 38% said no. Question two, digital archive, 88% said yes. Okay. Um, have you written a response to archive? Oh, Rami, this is interesting. 50-50 split there. And number four, have you created a performance response to archival material? 40% said yes, 60% said no. Okay, so really mixed group, which is great. Um, I think that will, hopefully we'll be able to, um, I'll share the results with you. Can you see that now? Yes, okay. So we'll stop sharing and I'll hand over to Alex who will present the Weave project in kind of nuts and bolts, really quick whistle stop um, presentation about all the things we're doing, which is a lot. So over to Alex. Alex, I don't think we can hear you. spotlight you yes. there we go thank you very much and good morning so i hope that you can see my presentation and hear me as well yes we can we can right. so um thank you rosa for this wonderful introduction to the day and i'm very happy to be here with you and to give you this very very quick overview of weave um my name is Alex. I work for IN2, um, the SME that's working to improve how we, um, how everyone is able to access digital content. And um, in this capacity, we coordinate the WIF project. Um, so what does WIF stand for? It's about widening European access to cultural communities via Europana. Um, it is, as Rosa mentioned, a uh, self-funded project that um, started this year, is running until next year. Um, that's aiming to develop and provide a framework that will link and um, uh, show the connections between tangible and intangible heritage. Um, and very important now of focusing on cultural communities, um, um, especially with view on um, minority and underrepresented or misrepresented communities. And um, the, the aim is to bring them uh, to the center of attention by making them accessible in Europana. And because some of you have already responded in um, uh, the poll that you don't know what your pen is, I'll get back to this and, uh, in a second. Um, first, just a bit about the, the project. The website is weaveculture.eu. So um, we put the link uh, afterwards in the chat as well, so you can check it out. And the collaboration is, um, um, as Rosa mentioned, uh, quite a few partners. Um, both from, let's say, the cultural heritage side, the um, archive side, but also universities and European Fund Foundation itself. You see here the full list of partners. And of course, on the website, you can um, learn more about each of them. Um, so what is Europana? Europana is an initiative of uh, the European Union, um, which started in 2008 and it uh, received um, political and financial support from the Commission since then. Um, the core idea is that um, um, uh, cultural heritage is um, a key building block for the building of a sense of European identity. Um, and uh, European Im imagines cultural heritage sector um, to be powered by digital technologies 
and it imagines Europe to be powered by culture. Um, and with this in mind, um, uh, Europana was started. Um, now, um, uh, Europana has over 50 million records um, with many archives, uh, libraries, museums contributing to this. Um, and the, let's say the central hub of this is the Europana portal and the Europana website, uh, where you can um, explore the content. But of course, Europana provides also um, uh, for professionals, especially, and for researchers, um, uh, special spaces where they can uh, go deeper into a certain topics related to how, for instance, to digitize cultural heritage, how um, to make it accessible. So um, there's a lot to explore and uh, also only if uh, you want to, let's say, see a bit of European art or if you're interested more in the practice of um, digital cultural heritage. Now back to um, to Weave, and um, uh, if you remember, I mentioned that Weave is targeting uh, cultural um, communities. Um, why this? Well, um, a few years ago, when um, um, uh, the events of the fire of Notre Dame and many other tragic events um, have happened, and reminded everyone of the let's say perishable nature of iconic monuments and cultural heritage that we take for granted um it become obvious that a lot has to be done to preserve this and to make sure that this um, um can be accessible to future generations as well um but um the problem was that um um, in fact, the intangible cultural heritage, although not as present as uh, having such a risk, is actually more of a, a, at the risk um, um, than ever before. Um, so it is important to acknowledge that actually the, the tangible heritage and the intangible one are very well connected um, and that one has to pay attention to both when digitizing and when uh, preserving this type of heritage. Uh, for the future generations. With this in mind, uh, WIF um, aims to provide this framework for linking and, and, and connecting these aspects. Um, the communities that we target in the project um, is the Roma community, traditional Portuguese dance and culture, um, historical dance and Castellier um, community. Um, there are a couple of other content types that we um, engage with in the project, like 3D and um, um, uh, let's say uh, representations of um, um, tangible heritage like castles from Slovenia. Um, but mostly uh, the, the communities, that's the one that I mentioned previously. Um, uh, the project itself will bring new content to Europana, 3D objects, videos, and photographs, very important for today's um, uh, lab day. Um, but it will also um, provide new tools uh, for working with uh, digital cultural heritage. And I will just very quickly give an, an overview of this. Um, there are four different tools. The first one is related to 3D assets. So for anyone who's interested in uh, managing, visualizing uh, 3D assets. Um, the WIF 3D Asset Manager is um, specifically uh, built for this reason. Um, Motion Notes is another very interesting tool, especially uh, for those working with the dance practice, um, because it allows the annotation of movements, um, including a semi automatic recognition of specific gestures and movements um, in videos, but also in the 3D space. So very uh, fascinating work by colleagues at the University of, of the University of Lisbon. Um, in order to make uh, the stories of communities uh, known to, to, to the general public and also in order to organize um, uh, own content and inspirational content together, um, uh, we bring uh, the Weave Experience uh, tool. Um, WeaveX is a tool for managing different types of Europana content, but also own content and creating stories, galleries, scrapbooks. Um, so it's something that is quite versatile um, and can help um, not only dancers, but also others um, that want to um, 
uh, engage with content and um, uh, tell stories with it. Now, finally, um, something a bit more technical. There are some tools for automatically enriching the metadata of the content that we've aggregated to Europeana. And uh, these are the so-called metadata enrichment tools. Um, very few words about what is, um, let's say, ongoing currently in the project and what is coming up. Um, you will be able to test this uh, with Toolkit. Uh, first version is going to be released the end of November. Some of the tools are already on um, uh, uh, on uh, the website and can be publicly um, uh, used, um, such as the Web Experience. Others um, will have a link at uh, um, the very end of November. So everyone is invited, please, to um, join this. And um, if you think that this is something interesting for your research, for your practice, um, feel free to try it out. And uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Um, the series of lab days is ongoing and um, will continue throughout the next month still. Um, and finally, there will be capacity building actions um, such as events, um, European cafes, for instance. Um, there will be training and resources that will be published. Um, and for instance, already a white paper on intangible heritage has been already uh, prepared and is available um, to be downloaded from the website. So lots of interesting um, um, actions happening um, as a direct output of the project. And um, if you want to keep up with, let's say, the news, um, you please follow um, our blog from the website or subscribe to our newsletter. Um, we'll try to be very mindful of your inbox and not uh, spam you uh, more than a couple of times a year. So. Um, <laughs> um, please do subscribe and uh, with this I would like to um, wish you all a very very nice lab day and um, yes I'm myself very excited of uh, uh, the next points of the program thank you thank you Alex thank you for that um, lovely presentation um, and to hear about the tools and also the different ways that people can get involved. Um, with that, I now hand over to John from Top Photo, who um, is a partner within the project and also who connected Romy and Cristela with us and kind of told us about the, the work and, and the residency. And when I saw the work, I was just blown away by it. There was so much feeling and kind of, um, yeah, history and, and their emotion in, in, the, in the work. And I said, John, what, you know, this is beautiful. How do we make something happen? And so then John, you know, explained a little bit about the work, that, the archive they have, and also the work with the residency. Um, but I hand that over to you so you can, yeah, help us, everyone else understand what's happened. And then we'll go over to Ravi. Yeah, thanks, Rosa. Well, uh, I'll try my audio description. So I'm a <laughs> middle-aged white man. I'm wearing glasses and a blue sweater. Um, I have quite an eclectic background, um, such as the beauty of working at home. It includes my uh, Gandolfi camera, which is about 100 years old. It still gets a little bit of use by me, but uh, not as much as I'd like to. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Hopefully you can see that, okay. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Top Photo and um, we're, we're a content partner in, in the Weave project. And the content we are supplying, um, as we have done for a number of EU projects, is in the form of images um, from our archive of some 5 million image objects. Uh, some of them date back to the 19th century it includes glass plates, acetate negatives, transparencies, vintage photographic prints, illustration, engravings. Anything that is an image, you know, basically is housed in our archive. And we, <clears throat> when we think of photo photographs today, you know, they are very much intangible. Um, they live sort of digitally on, on phones or, um, you know, possibly you know, on the cloud or in hard drives, but rarely do we ever see them in printed form. 
you know, an archive of, of photographs, however, is tangible. And just like all physical objects, you know, they, they fade and they decay over time. And the rate of degradation can be accelerated by a number of factors. This includes how well they've been treated in their lifetime, but it also, you know, how they came into being, you know, which all photographic material, it begins with a saturation of chemicals and that smell rarely leaves them. This is accentuated by quantity. Um, because of the various ages and stages um, of different parts of the archives in our collections, you know, they, they're a bit like zoological animals. You know, the glass plates are middle-aged tortoises. You know, they're very old already, but they seemingly will remain unchanged forever. Um, whereas our acetate negatives are half the age of the glass plates. Um, and they're already on the critically endangered list. You know, they, they threaten to release their gas, which sort of bubbles through the plastic carrier and leaving behind a badly reticulated image and a strong, unmistakable vinegar odor. Um, this is a common problem in archives. And we, are, and I mean all of us here and beyond, have a small window of opportunity uh, to save the image and capture our collective visual history for future generations. Um, and, and, you know, the original is unlikely to be able to be saved, but the image that, you know, you can capture, we can save that, we can do that now. Prominent features of archives uh, like ours are long rows of steel filing cabinets, metal tins, pull out drawers, cardboard boxes and containing folders, plastic storage sleeves, plastic film and negative and positive color, heavy glass in the form of negatives and mountains and mountains of paper and prints, caption sheets, index cards, books and ephemera. And although light is the enemy of fade, without light an image does not exist. It cannot be created and it cannot be seen. So although an archive can hibernate in dark storage to live, it needs light and it also needs interaction. The collections of top photo have always been accessible and the primary function for the photographs we have are for them to be found and published. The top photo right now, that publication comes through licensing. This could be a history textbook, a factual TV documentary, a biography, or other editorial context use. The where, the who, the what, when, why are all very important. But it also could be on a packet of crisps or a beauty product or a simple greetings card where image is king. And other factors have little or no consideration. It may be on the cover of a fictional book where the image reflects somebody else's story, an image for imagination. In every context, context, the, the published image plays an important role to narrative, either to reinforce fact, to comment on who we are, influence who we should be, or creatively take us to somewhere that only exists in our mind. For the physical toll that endures on a constantly accessible archives, I could use the analogy of a toy that a collector keeps untouched in his box versus toys that are actually played with. Unfortunately for photography in the wider world, ever since its invention in 1839, the vast majority of photographic material has become unwanted and discarded, rarely collected in that pristine state. This leaves archives like Top Photo as an irre irreplaceable resource for, for narratives and especially the ones that have been overlooked or badly generalized in the past. It is important to consider how or why an image exists in an archive. For Top Photo, most of the collections are press photo archives and the intention was publication in tomorrow's newspaper or next week or next month's magazine. For tomorrow's paper, a photographer might have been sent out with just a couple of glass plates or half a dozen sheet films. Um, and they may have had a few rolls of film by the time 35 millimeter cameras were in use. For the pre-digital era, 
Um, for tomorrow's news, what has survived is the edited cut. And that would be undoubtedly what Cassia Bresson famously coined as the decisive moment. Often a single solitary frame. If we are lucky, we still have a couple of extras. In the news world, we have to accept that most of our photographic history failed to survive beyond day one and cherish the edited moments that have endured. For magazine publication where multiple images reflecting a wider story were likely to be used, sets of images can survive. Again, considering the longevity of those images for publication was limited and the intended, intended audience was a very populist contemporary one of the day, certainly without any consideration for the 21st century or beyond. If one can't tell from the image itself who that audience was, then the surviving captions or publications that they appeared in do. And it is quite clear that the communities we are trying to reach in, in the Weave project, who may well have been the subject of photographic stories, were certainly not the intended audience. Rediscovering those images and the process of rewriting those narratives before our visual history is lost through decay and other factors is critical. It is why Top Photo uh, is part of the Weave project. And it is also why we wanted to work with Romy Smith and commission her as writer in residence earlier this year. I cannot emphasize how thrilled we were with the result. A series of eight written responses, new poetry, monologues and lyrics inspired by the voices and stories in selected photographs from the Top Photo Archive, together with music by Christella Littrus and performed by actor Liddell Bryant. Before I leave you, I realize I've mentioned age and decaying deterioration quite a bit. Um, and I must stress that the Top Photo Archive is a living archive. Digitization is our friend and innovative creativity to engage with a 21st century audience gives us renewed life for the archive or should I say a transformative one, one that will hopefully live on beyond our generation of guardianship, allowing future generations to build further narratives to the image, images that we have saved for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, I love this, um, you know, that you ended on saying it's a living archive. And I can't help but also think about, you know, that smell and thinking about these rows of file cabinets and, you know, what that experience must be like. And, and you know, I wonder, is there a tension there? I mean, these are things we can perhaps talk about a bit later around having the physical, the tangible, but, you know, also the benefits of that digital space. And, you know, how do we kind of ensure that we're honoring both spaces? And I think Rami and uh, Cristela have, in a way, found a, um, not a solution, but, you know, in, in a moment, a process that worked for them to do that, to bring also really um, heavily charged topics and images and and looking at that and then saying okay how do we bring that into a modern space how do we look at that and how do we respond and what might that response look like if it's a creative response um, uh, a written one what does that look and feel like and so I think um, you know that moves us into Rami and Cristela your your residency and your work um, so over to to you ladies um, for yeah to, to understand the, the, the masterminds of the residency thank you Rosa yes thank you um, let's see I'm unmuted brilliant so I think for this moment you're going to want to spotlight me and then I'm going to bring Stella in so my I'll give my presentation and then there's some key moments that Stella's going to come in brilliant Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and talk about a residency about which I feel 
hugely passionate um, and I'll come to that in my talk and wonderful to um, be a creative inter uh, interlocutor with Weave and to be thinking in this way about conceptually what weaving means and that has been a fundamental um, method and I'm going to talk about that so thank you very much and welcome to everybody I'm noticing all the different parts of the world that people are from and it's fabulous to see you here um, so I will begin um, and I'm ably uh, assisted in terms of the slides wonderful thank you so much uh, Kausa so um, I will just So there's a, a number of things that I want to uh, talk about uh, to start. And I'd like to go to slide two, please. This idea of weaving. Just going to let you read the definitions here and I'll also say them out loud for the audio. To form or fabricate by interlacing yarns or other filaments of a particular substance in a continuous web, to manufacture in a loom by crossing the threads or yarns called respectively the warp and the weft. Also with uh, uh, object, the web itself, a garment made up of such a stuff or material to weave out, to complete the weaving of. I'm also gonna skip on. Um, to make a complex story or pattern from a number of interconnected ele ele um, elements is another definition I have here. But that one that number two, in a figurative context, in many languages, the equivalent verb is used in metaphorical expressions relating to the contriving of plots or deception. But that notion of many languages and stories and narratives is something that is absolutely pertinent here. So to weave. It also always begins with a line, a line of thread, yarn, wool, cotton, rush, straw, palm, story, dialogue, plot, text, music, light, dance, poetry, speech and song. The blurred line between speech and song, between poetry and music. Lines of poetry like lyrics read or heard then kept in the head and the heart like promise or solace or both, each lifting us to the horizon line of better things, beginnings. Line, line, the corpsing actor calling out uh, off stage into the darkness for a lifeline of text. Line as in the corporeal outline of a body or idea coming into being the somatic flow of the arc of an arm in response to a line of melody, meaning, translating these into a continuation of movement. The feet, beat and meter of a line of formal poetry, its lineation upon the white page demarcating the edges of black text from the white space which surrounds and encompasses it. The poet Ruth Bedell writes in her book of lectures entitled The Silent Letters of the Alphabet, that breath is caught and held across white spaces, meaning that the space or territory between the typically black text and the white page is a place of pause, of surprise expressed in the form of an intake of breath. These pauses utilized as rest and momentum before the flow of speech and energy brings us into the new road of the next line. I also read this line about breath being caught and held across white spaces differently in a context of race and as a black woman in a context of both anti-black racism and the concept of the black gaze, a thought to which I'll return to later. This is a practice steep presentation. And what does practice steeped mean? Practice steeped is my own term for knowledge which emerges suffused or immersed in practice rather than being led by it. Led is suggestive of practice which exists in front of and most importantly, outside of the knowledge it produces. Steeped and practice steeped suggests knowledge that is embodied by or housed within practice. 
So in this presentation, I focus on lines as they relate to the photograph. I reflect on how in my top photo residency journey, these lines of light and shade inspire lines of what is at its root poetry and sometimes poetic forms such as the sonnet, ballad and guzzle, but also takes the form of scripts so and monologue and dialogue which also sometimes takes epistolary forms such as the letter. With contributions from musician and composer Christella Lutras, my collaborator in this residency journey, I present something from my vantage point as a poetically driven writer of how the lines of the photograph and the lines of the poems, narrative lines, lines of form, temporal lines, borders and boundary lines, crossed or held, intersect with the song lines and music of Christella Littras's composition, how my own poetry's melody line is shaped and changed by its dialogic encounter with Stella's music. All of the seven key residency pieces that we produced, uh, which were set to music, were launched in June 2021 via Top Photo's own SoundCloud page, and you can listen to them in full via the link. So if we could just go to three, um, we won't click on that now, but you know that it exists. And you can... Uh, click on that to listen to them all in your, in your own time, but we'll be doing a, a hybrid live version today. So especially for today's event, we'll hear two of the pieces in their rework for digital live format, and I'll come back to those later. My residency is ensconced with what Simone Ostoff, the art critic and historian of contemporary art, terms performing the archive. So could we go to the next slide, please? Let's give you a little time to look at that one. And then I'll also read it. From the archive as a repository of documents to the archive as a dynamic and generative production tool. These performances literally transform the archive into an artwork. Others question its institutional boundaries, all contributing to change the archive's former stability, function, use, and meaning. My residency and the work I have created evidences. Could we go to the next slide, please? how photos, but also the concept of archive, and more specifically in the case of my residency, Top Photos Archive functions as a spark for new work. But my position as a writer, Anna Stella, and I will discuss in the Q&A her position as a composer and musician, is as interlocutors of the archive, in conversation with its content, in affectual and haptic terms. We are as much drawing inspiration from its photos as its ghosts, its presences, its absences. Each photo is both a memorial and a document of time travel. Each person in that archive is as real and here then as we are real and here now. So this presentation then consists of thought snapshots, um, cerebral stills from my residency process notebook of how the lines within a photograph inspire lines of poetry, monologue, script and lyrics and fuse them. I fuse those with, with music in collaboration with Stella to create a sonic event. We'll go to the next slide, please. So I'll read this. This is a quote from John Berger, Ways of Seeing. But there is also another sense in which seeing comes before words. It is seeing that establishes our place in the surrounding world. We explain that world with words. The relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. Each evening we see the sun set. This is so important as a quote in terms of the residency, the notion of disruption and what the images that I've selected from the Top Photo Archive to, to disrupt and unsettle and never leave settled um, dominant narratives, um, established narratives to challenge them. This is what we see within um, the residency selection that I've made from the, the Top Photo Archive. So where does my um, residency at Top Photo begin? And uh, we'll go to the next image, please. It begins here. 
this is where it begins. And it begins in the early spring of 2019. And this photograph, I'm attending the first British American project, um, writer's retreat, and I'm making a cup of tea in the farmhouse kitchen. Flora um, is bringing um, a sepia toned digital album of photographs entitled the Smith Collection, part of the Top Photo Archive into the kitchen. And I notice the name on the cover, Smith, and register the metaphors, our shared surname, our resonances and differences. I don't know yet that I'm on the cusp of what will be a three year conversation. I open the album and I'm spellbound immediately struck that what unites these temporarily distant photographs, these stories of people and places across time and space is the racial diversity of the protagonists in them. These photos flip the script on Britishness. My history lessons did not look like this. Could we go to the next slide, please? This is an image of the great racing tipster, Prince Monolulu. The stunning photos disrupt monoculturalist ideas of Britishness as white and dominant narratives of blackness as other. Back in 2019, I suggested to Flora that a series of artists in residence respond to the top photo archive, engaging with these extraordinary images taken by photographers, including Ken Russell, Roger Bamber and Tom John Topham. I am delighted to hold the first creative residency in the Top Photo Archive and to be its first writer in residence. I recently selected 34 of these magnificent images from the archive for an up and coming exhibition called Changing the Story, photographs of British life in black and white, the forthcoming exhibition at North Wall from the 10th to the 29th of January, 2022. There are many more in the Top Photo Archive than I could include, but each image is part of the changing story of Britishness in black and white. At the crossroads where the archive and the present tense meet, here I am, a writer of mixed heritage, tuning in, looking at the images down the decades. This is an archive of voices. You can hear the whisperings of the past through the porous palimpsest. Dr. Mark Seeley, director of Autograph, said of the archive, quote, it feels like there are things in those boxes calling to be let out. So we need to tune in. I want to turn to looking at my methods as writer in residence. And one of those, the first one that I utilize is this notion of tuning in. It's my first creative method, the first defining method in my practice. It is about sensation. It is about hunch and it is about clue. Lines of light and dark, black and white intersect at the camera lens, which focuses and collects light. Manually adjusting the aperture of the camera decides how much light is let in. The narrower the aperture, the less light. The wider the aperture, the more light is let in. Lines of light intersect at the aperture to produce memory. I think about this light as a kind of haunting of the camera and the photographer and eventually the spectator. Now, I'm com completely and acutely conscious of the racial bias that sits at the centre of Western tools of photographic production, particularly film manufacturing and guidance uh, documents concerning skin tone and the production of something called the Shirley card. So I want to, to just make a, a quick reference to that. Could we go to the next slide, please? This is from Sarah Lewis and from a 2015 article called The Racial Bias Built Into Photography. She writes, photography is not just a system of calibrating light, but a technology of subjective decisions. Light skin became the chemical baseline for film technology, fulfilling the needs of its target dominant market. For example, developing colour film technology initially required what was called the Shirley card. When you sent your film off to get it developed, lab technicians would use the image of a white woman with brown hair named Shirley as the measuring stick against which they calibrated all other colours. Quality control meant that Shirley's face looked good. 
It translated into the color bal balancing of digital technology. And in the mid 1990s, Kodak created a multiracial Shirley card with three women, one black, one white, one Asian, and later included a Latina model in an attempt or in an attempt intended to get or help camera operators calibrate skin tones. These were not adopted by everyone since they coincided with the rise of digital photography. The result was film emulsion technology that still carried over the social bias of earlier photographic conventions. So I want to acknowledge that and my awareness of that when I come to look at the image, um, who the devices were intended for um, in terms of use, who they were, who they set up as a standard, if you like. This haunts me. And my fascination with haunting extends in other places. It extends with my engagement with the Derridian concept of hauntology, which is the study of the nature of being haunted. Archives are haunted places mapped in memory, a crossroads where we, the present tense, meet the past tense. We too are archives haunted by experience and memory via which we carry the past tense with us as we move into the future. I'll talk about this in a moment in relationship to the poem sonnet for the man whose name I cannot trace. But what I would like to do if we go back into the room is I'd like to call on Stella please to perform that for us. Okay. After lives of fire, the after lives of fire, your stock, your stock and trade. Each vault a bank of ash. Each vault a bank of ash. Profit rates are grey. You raise the average. You raise the average. My brother Roll out of Nestle Central Engine Shed Journeying out from Marnibone Your sable freight and elongated sentence From Pepsner's guides to British parties And if I think of what you teach me in the here and now It's how to make a path from ash Keep your head above ground Consider it. Did white man sheep work by a decree? Erase your law. Erase your law. On medical. On medical degree. For the title, Ashby Cleaner. Brother titled Ashby Cleaner. The Phoenix has flown her nest. The Phoenix has flown her nest. The afterlife of fire. The afterlife of fire. Your stock and train. train. Each vault a bank of ash. Each, Each vault a bank of ash. Profit rates are great. You raise the average. You raise the average. 
Church, my brother. You raise the average, my brother. Brother. Many thanks, Stella. Fabulous and wonderful to, to be reminded of what it is to be in space with each other and, and create that in, in your studio. This is the image, Roger Bamber's photograph of the Ashpit cleaner, which inspired that poem, which is a sonnet. Um, and inspired the imagery that you hear in the music and we'll be talking about that that later. I want to talk about this poet and this this sonnet or little song and the processes of writing its text. I want to engage with the title of the scholar Philip Bryan Harper's chapter Speculative Rumination, the evidence of felt intuition. Harper uses the term speculative rumination as a tool to examine being assigned as other by the white gaze, and in his case, the speech of a white man who grilled him about his origins and birthplace on board a train. For the record, Harper is black and he's American. Here, inspired by Harper's term, I repurpose it and I locate it within an inspirational gesture performed by the muse of Roger Bamber's 1962 photograph, which you see here of a young black man, an ash pit cleaner of a black 544848 steam train. I have a hunch immediately when I see this image and I am drawn to this image early on. I feel lifted by it as though the line of this portrait muse's gaze is telling me, teaching me something. I follow the felt intuition in me and I sit with the photograph or rather a digital version of it because my residency is remote due to the pandemic. In the image, the man is surrounded as you can see by steep banks of ash from the fires which fuel the train's engine. His head and the, his shoulders emerge out of the ground. He smiles. He looks directly into the eye of the camera, this gesture, a refusal of Eurocentric canonical historical expectations that black portrait muses adopt physical gestures of deference and do not meet the gaze of the, it is assumed, white spectator of the image. This portrait muse looks at us eye to eye. My resultant poem meditates on the unsung black workers who built British industries doing what Stuart Hall et al termed shit work or white man shit work in order to build Britain's post-war reputation. To utilize a term examined by scholars, including Tina Camped in her 2021 book, A Black Gaze, My Black Gaze sees this particular black man's gaze and I feel a recognition. Though the photograph is past tense, I begin to meditate on what the stance of, a ma of the man in this image has to teach me about how to manage my quotidian contemporary experience of particularly anti-Black racism and misogynoir. I have no name by which to search for him. His name is unrecorded by the photographer, which was common standard functional practice for photojournalists of Robert Roger Bamber's era and still happens now. But in a political context, this absence of a name haunts me, and it does so in a context of a longer history of the erasure of the birth names of those who were enslaved. And the, these people are the forebears of this man in the photo. My use of the word brother then arises from the absence of a name. The use of the word brother is a substitute for community and kindredness. It's a racialized ley line. Um, it's a, that word is the needle at the center of the sink. Um, the, a racialized ley line is the needle at the center of the single compass of the word brother. The sonnet form feels right a note length poem in a platonic sense, a love poem of respect and kindredness to the unnamed inspiration whose black gaze sets something in me free. The ghost edges of the final lines of the poem arrive in me first, leading me somewhere. Head above ground were some of the first words that came to me when I looked at the image. 
When I think about the situatedness of the man, he exists in a landscape of muted greys and carbon black, the sable train, the banks of ash. I research banks, as in fiscal banks, and I decide to utilise some of the image of stockbroking, profit rates, raise, stock and trade to disrupt any cliched imagery of describing someone who cleans trains. I consider what ash is in metaphorical and literal terms and inspired by the work of Sadia Hartman and her, particularly her concept of the afterlives of slavery, which is a term to describe the aftershocks of slavery, which still manifest and vibrate socially, economically, politically, culturally, and racially. I reflect on what ash is. I craft an intertextually referenced line, the afterlives of fire, because ash is technically the afterlife of fire. I also meditate upon the resourcefulness of a man, a human being, be able to, being able to craft something, a life, a living from what is considered spent. I broaden the aperture of my eye and I think about the landscape of this image, the sable freight of a Black Five train traversing the landscape, rather like the man in the image journeys the British landscape. This makes me think of the architecturalist Niklaus Pevsner, a German Jewish refugee to the UK in the 50s and 60s, diligently mapping the British Isles and producing amongst other texts, a, a, a celebrated 46 volume series of county by county guides, the buildings of England, 1951 to 74. Both, both Pevsner and the unnamed man in a sense are outsiders navigating the British landscape, writing their ways into it via ink and steam, respectively. In my critical work, I write about the ghost document, and this is something that I want to come to next. Could we go to the next image, please? This is Judy Johnson. Ghost document is um, part of my original contribution to knowledge in my thesis, and it's a term I developed to define the documents that exist beneath the surface of the items we can see in an archive. And I want to talk about this concept in relation to my poem, The Ballad of Judy Johnson's Blues. But first, I would love to hear Stella sing. I ask for water I won't cry anymore Tears are rolling and tumbling If I remember you if I remember you, I'll dance my blues. You're a piece of smoke stand lightning. Oh, 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 oh. Every night about this time. Nothing else will rival the blues. Before sunrise, she sings. Fall asleep, less than hopeful. Oh. The blues are the compass. The blues are kind of patois. Oh, unraveling each song from a traveling case all the way from Jamaica. Sitter as cars 
swoops whilst Judy's backs to the camera. Terry's got a lot to write. The absolute beginner. Find Judy's other photograph for history to remember. Morning waits on Denmark Street. Chances round the corner. But Judy stays at the A and A. Where it's always after hours The blues are kind of compass The blues are kind of patois Kind of patois Unraveling each song from her travelling case All the way from Jamaica then Judy Johnson disappears with her set lists and desires. Faster than the ghosts in the rising smoke of an unattended bloodbath. Research. There's a question in the ether. There's a rumor in the research. There's a question in the ether that, that haunts the archives of the air. This knows the great of paper Stirs every blackbird on the roof Stirs every blackbird on the roof On the roof of the skyline's architecture And every waiting gale that sings each awakening each so waking so hope I love did Judy Johnson disappear or do we just not see her there's a cusp moon out on Flitcroft Street where the punters are heading for Ben. But Judy Johnson is singing her dreams. Yes, Judy Johnson's leaving her dress. Where the dreams of the architect Thank you. Many thanks, Stella. Uh, again, wonderful to hear you. Um, I want to talk to you about that particular image and how it inspired the words that you've just heard um, Stella sing and me speak virtually. Um, the archive, the top photo archive holds a single image of Judy Johnson. And this becomes radical in the context that I'm about to outline to you. A digital search over several months brought images of other Judy Johnsons, the black American baseball player, Judy Johnson, male, born in 1900, and the white American pop singer, Judy Johnson, born in 1928. Neither of them is the Judy Johnson for whom I am looking. I began to jot down the lines from that place of research, there's a rumor in the research because that's what it began to feel like. Other than this image within the top photo archive, Judy Johnson had become something of a rumor. 
The caption which accompanies the image of Judy Johnson in the top photo archive says, and I'm quoting, A&A spells nightlife for the teenagers. West Indian singer Judy Johnson gives a blues number at the A&A in September 1953. I search and I cannot find. Judy Johnson becomes a kind of ghost document in herself, the text beneath the surface of other texts about Soho life, the a and Club, the Sunset Club, the architectural practice of Paul McCanary, which was until recently at 6 Flickcroft Street, which is the former location of the a and Club in the 1950s. She becomes a woman I cannot trace, like the man, the ash pit cleaner I cannot trace, except I have her name and not his. I consider Claudia Rankin's point in her 2015 Guardian article that, quote, the invisibility of black women is astounding. And so the ballad of Judy Johnson's blues becomes not just a poem for Judy Johnson, but it becomes a song symbolic and speaking in some way to the experience of many black women who know what it is to be made invisible and to be subject to erasure. I research and research again and find that the only other image I can find of a blues singer called Judy Johnson, same time period, living in London, exactly like this Judy Johnson in the image, is of a woman. And I'm going to um, put this image in the chat feed and I'd like you to click on it and open it because this is the only other image I can find of Judy Johnson. And I'm going to say nothing while you look and see why this is significant. And I want you to hold that image for a moment. These are Ida Carr Carr's, the photographer Ida Carr's portraits of Terry Taylor officially but Judy Johnson appears in them, but how does she appear? And this becomes significant. And this is what makes this image so important. To my knowledge, it is the only face on image of Judy Johnson that I can find. And as you can see here, well, what do we see? Does someone want to say, what do we see? I want to jump in. What do we see in this image? Oh, is Judy Johnson presented? And there are three images and she features in exactly the same way. Anybody want to unmute? So, so um, it's Kosa here. Um, Hi, Kosa. Oh. Um, so the image that you shared in the chat is obviously you know she's got her back turned to the camera she's in the background um she's faceless voiceless um and she's an object isn't she great points this also i think some other things that we could say about the image thanks uh, thanks for that contribution would anybody else like to add anything to what's been said there I think what's really interesting is that um, she's enveloped in smoke. Um, yes. There's a, a really interesting symmetry there, um, uh, you know, between um, basically the man with closed eyes, um, smoking, and it's as if this mythical figure appears. Um, and so it's also this kind of uh, projected desire uh, for the black body. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's a very intriguing figure as well, because it's as if um, she doesn't really take part in this you know, projected um, uh, well, I think fantasy. Yes, you know, she's she's Maybe. actually giving her back. So in a sense, you know, she's uh, she's uh, kind of trapped into that, but not uh, an accomplice. Thank you both. Some wonderful readings of that image. And I think what's so important, I wanted to go to the smoke. She becomes spectral. And that's what in, uh, inspires the image 
faster than the ghosts in the rising smoke of an unattended gouloirs with French cigarette, the idea of a cigarette smoking itself out and producing ghosts. That's where I take the image is from this image where Judy's back to the camera. And this is the image of Terry Taylor, a raconteur man about town who inspired one of the characters in the novel Absolute Beginners. He is the center, she is not, and she is distanced and she's represented in this way three times so this became symbolic for me and so as I say I research and I can only find this image of her and um, she has her back to the camera a black woman with her back to the camera in 1950s London a spectral backdrop to the main image so I write from this place it's a place of a refusal of her invisibility Marielle Rosello terms this the reparative narrative, and that's what I seek in writing the, uh, um, the ballad of Judy Johnson's blues. It's a refusal not only of Judy Johnson's invisibility, it's a refusal of my own invisibility, and it's a refusal of the invisibilities of other black women. And I will pause there. And I will hand back to Rosa. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Rami and Cristela and everyone who's been engaging with um, the work today. Um, yeah, there's so much in there. It's, it's quite difficult to, I think, try and get all of the things that are emerging just in questions for me. So I'm assuming that that's true for everyone else. But I would like to offer the space for anyone in the room to um, to ask a question or comments or anything that, you know, maybe we can just take 10 seconds and check in with our bodies and just see what's emerging for us and just have, yeah, just take a moment and then come back and maybe something might emerge there. So just 10 seconds. Okay. Yeah, any words, anything that you want to add, drop in the chat. Any questions you have for Rami, Cristela, Alex, um, John, that have emerged for you? I see. It would be wonderful also, uh, Rosa, for us to have a three-way conversation about practice. That would be wonderful to do that too. I'd love to be in dialogue with you about our process as it relates to your practice too. As sure. This event. sure. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think um, I, I just want to honor the, the Marie Louise said so powerful. I love this notion of ghost documents. Um, and that's something also that I've picked up on today. This, you know, you use these terms haunting um, ashes, ghosts. Um, and, you know, that, there's some, I, I, at the core of that, I can't help but think about the body and the embodied kind of histories and narratives that we all have. Um, and so, you know, and, and having Cristela here also singing and, you know, we're seeing you use your body and your voice. And that's something so primal, you know, that voice, that humming, that... And at the same time, it's overlaid on top of, you know, the poetry, which is sometimes whispering. Sometimes you can hear it. Sometimes you can't. Yeah. And yeah, it's so it's just quite layered. And I think that, you know, you talked about that in your methods as well, that there's a tuning in and you were looking at how things intersect, but not only kind of stepping away from the practice led but going into this practice steeped you know and how you've developed this method so all of these things I feel kind of come together to look at critically these questions around images um, stories what's haunting 
um, personally what haunts us, how we bring that forward. Um, so yeah, any, uh, I do want to give anyone a space for a question. I, I realize the time, any reflections? There's a comment um, in. Yes, oh. Alda, Alda. Sorry. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on um, um, this amazing project um, and on this amazing collaboration and the method you're using, which is, um, yeah, how things should be. <laughs> um, I'd be really interested to know what kind of challenges you're facing at the moment uh, in terms of COVID working on Zoom remotely. Um, we were talking about, you know, the sensorial quality of the archive. I've been working with archives for, I don't know, the past 25 years myself. And in a sense, you know, um, working with digitization as well and um, the absence of the smell and the touch of the material. And it's, it's obviously, that is the beauty actually of the archive in many ways. And so I'm kind of very interested to understand how you are working, for example, in composing the music, in writing the ballads, in, in you know, getting to the image, in reflecting uh, with our beautiful Rosa. I mean, you know, how, how you doing these in the context of COVID, in the context of Zoom, in this absence of touch. Um, so how do you recreate that touch? I'd be interested to know. Thanks. Well, I turned my kitchen into a recording studio. <laughs> and, and, you know, and we had to respect, obviously, the, the restrictions. So Romy walked into my house with this bodysuit on, <laughs> and a mask, glasses. I'm not even joking, I promise you. And uh, it was, I remember Romy saying that she hasn't really been out and mixed with people. Everything's been online. And so I think it was the first project, correct me if I'm wrong, Romy, that um, she, she engaged with after, after the lockdown. Um, we invited Liddell Bryant, who's a phenomenal actor. He came in and recited some of the poetry. So there's three of us in my kitchen and I've got this big patio door that was wide open. So as, as you know, for singers, we've got to protect our voices, but we also had to respect that flow of air, <laughs> you know? Um, and you're right, you know, you're right, um, Alda, that whole energy of being together, you know, I'm, you know, touching someone's shoulder and sharing that energy and, and it's all about that vibe. So we were able to create that, that energy and um, I really wanted to invoke the spirit of, of Judy Johnson, you know, I wanted to I wanted to just tap into that energy and and try and understand how she would have sounded like um, her face expressions, you know, um, what energy she she projected, and um, I kind of went with a minor chord progression, a minor blues progression, and embodied it. Some people say, "How did you start? How did you do it?" And for me, I work with my spirit and I work with my heart, and I you know I can't. Um, I can't write it down and, and, and make it sound academic. But what I can say is that it's it's my vibe. And if I love something, I'm going to respond. And um, I, I've never been given the opportunity to respond to photos, like still images. Normally, I, I work with a lot of dancers. And the last Windrush project that I did was with Phoenix Dance, where I composed the music for a, narrative, a dance narrative. Uh, Windrush Movement of the People with Sharon Watson. So for me, that was like, that's just a lot going on, but I was just given this image to respond to and it felt quite, um, it was it was a really uh, moving, very spiritual experience for me and just to really go inside myself and be still and respond that way. So performing it for you all, felt um i was speaking to romy saying you know i feel like i just want you and i to perform it because it's there's a lot of call and response elements and you link these are key elements in calypso music the call and response and call and response can be found in music all over the world but um just referring to calypso 
and looking at the other piece that we did, the um, Brothers of the Black Five, that one that was all Calypso and looking at, you know, how, how to make that piece sound like a train track, like a train moving and having the brother, having those kind of sounds of the train and the effects. So I think for me, I, I, I was really lucky to be able to spend a lot of time with Romy and listening to her because she's just it's phenomenal to sit there and just listen to this knowledge and this wisdom. So I, I was able to channel it through the music. So to share it with you all, obviously it's a backing track. I don't normally work with backing tracks. We do everything live. But as you know, we have our limitations on Zoom. But I, you know, I, I really hope that you, you got the energy, received the energy of, of what we put together. So thank you. And I just think that speaks to like, the human spirit you know this the 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 power that you know um we can transmit our energy even via zoom you know and i think as a project this is one of the things of course the lab days were not when we th thought about them they weren't supposed to be this way they were supposed to be <laughs> body to body and that's how they were in the past so this was a, a completely different challenge, but it was important to kind of offer these opportunities to engage with material and layer it. So if it's the music coming, you know, and you sound incredible on a Zoom call, you know, that's like, that speaks to you, your voice and your spirit and your energy, but also the love behind that, uh, that I think is behind the project and the residency and the respect that I think, you know, is, is powerful. Um, Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Rami, I don't know if you have any thoughts on your process. Yeah, I mean, I, um, other than the studio time and going to work in studio with uh, Stella and Liddell, actually writing is quite a solo process. So actually, to be completely honest, it wasn't unusual. I was very productive during those quarantine mm. uh, periods where we had to stay home. Um, I wrote a play during that time. I had the gift of this residency during that time. I finished my thesis during that time. You know, so there was a lot that I was doing. So it made me very productive. And actually my day was very much, there were no distractions. It's very clear. I was at my laptop by a certain time. I worked till late. I just got down to it because there was nothing else pulling me to be anywhere else. So was, I have to answer with great respect to, uh, uh, to the fact of the time that we're in and the, the devastation and the havoc that that has caused emotionally, for people in and particularly those who've lost people so I want to be mindful of that and what I say um, as a writer being here and in one place I focused and in that sense it was useful and actually I have to say what it enabled me to do was manage some of the difficult feelings about being isolated about not being able to see people I love um, because I had I had a, a mo I had a task every day. I had something to do. Um, I had a mission, if you like, and I had a creative research mission with this residency. So running alongside what I was doing in terms of say, maybe some of the uh, the critical parts of the thesis that I was writing uh, and the less creative parts of that, I had this purely creative, if you like, residency running alongside that, that, that moment. And so it was, um, it was a kind of respite for me, I, I would say. Um, and that's how I experienced it. And also, if I, if I take that idea of the lines that I began with, which is in no small part inspired by the anthropologist Tim Ingold's work around lines, there's a whole beautiful book on the line that he's written. That web that he are, uh, you know, that, that I was referring to and the, the, the definitions of weaving, actually, I felt a web of connection. So, yes, we got together and we were in space, but actually I felt Stella's energy even talking on the phone about the project. You know, there is a remote energy that we have as humans. You start pitching, you tune in to people. We send each other things. So nothing is wasted. I appreciate, you know, even... I mentioned haptics in my presentation. I didn't get to actually physically smell vinegar syndrome for some months later, um, uh, but 
I still had a feeling and emotion when I looked at these images. These are people in these stories. These people are stories. And I was tuning into those stories. And those stories were inspiring me to write poems, essentially, which became other things. So, yes, there were challenges, but I think humans are resourceful. And it's interesting for me, I was looking for the resourcefulness in some of the people who became muses, like the ash pit cleaner. That was what I tuned into at that time was his resourcefulness. So, yeah, yeah. Yes, and I'm very mindful of the time. And we did um, say that we would offer a bit of a break for everyone to, um, yeah, just, get up, be mindful of their bodies, um, to ha go get a cup of tea. You're of course welcome to come back to the writing um, workshop that we're going to have that starts at 12 in the UK, which is one for all of my Central European uh, <laughs> colleagues. Um, we would love it if everyone would come back. Um, I think it would be lovely to kind of keep going deeper and to explore this you know with our own embodied histories and see if or what haunts us um and but before that i do want to allow anyone a, a few a minute if they have any questions or comments um even from the speakers marie louise um john alex there was a question from marie louise crawley in the chat rosa oh, i think i saw that yes Hi, I'll just be really, really quick because I know we're, we're into break time, but um, thank you, first of all, um, Romy and Christella, really, really powerful, really beautiful work. I w I'd just love to hear more, perhaps this is for a bit, a bit later, but to hear more about how you alighted on this notion of ghost documents and what lies beneath. Um, uh, it resounded with me, some of my dance practice, I, I, I think about dance as radical archaeology um, from a feminist perspective for, for recovering and reparative narratives for, for Roman and ancient women from the ancient world, actually. Um, but I'm just really, really curious um, about this beautiful idea of the ghost document and how and tuning into what lies beneath and how you alighted upon that as a method. I know it's a big question. Hmm. Um, well, it's been a concept that I've been developing for the last seven years, and it's I write about it in depth in this wonderful book called Imagining Queer Methods, which is by edited by Armand Garziani and Matt Brim, published by New York University Press. And I talk in depth about it, about what it is there. But essentially what I was wanting to do, inspired by the scholarship of Jose Esteban Munoz, and particularly his chapter called Ephemera's Evidence, which if I am correct, is published in a dance magazine, um, a dance journal. And uh, I was particularly caught by the notion that the ephemeral never disappears, that it's always there, however much it's erased, and that is people and people's histories. And of course, Munoz is, is researching many things, including relationships between men. So the notion of sort of minoritarian narratives being subject literally to bleaching, to erasure. So inspired by that, I began to think about um, archives and about the spaces in between and about what exists, what we physically can see, what substance. And then I began to hit on the idea that, that actually there are other documents alongside those documents. And we, can't, we maybe can't see them, but we can sense that they're there. And it's those times in our research processes where maybe you put together, say, a triptych of three documents, and actually you know that they suggest another document that you cannot lay your hands on. That's the ghost document. That's the document that your hunch knows must exist because those three documents when you they intersect together tell you something and um my research concerns jazz and blues women and the historical black blues and jazz women and so my re the ghost document was coming out of that research um and particularly i was looking at um, Billy Holiday's same gender romances and looking at documents that look like they are one thing between her and or her lovers and X but actually when I look beneath the surface I know that what's driving or motivating that document that's been set by a lover of Billy Holiday's 
is the love letter. And so I'm interested in getting at that love letter. I can't find that, it doesn't exist. But actually, if I divine beneath the surface, I can find it. And that's where I use creativity to response, respond. So I'm particularly interested, I'm on a ley line with people like Sadia Hartman who are using speculation as a, as a method to respond to the absences in the archive. And that's what we've done here. I mean. I would just also say, for instance, the guzzle is in the imagined voice of Eileen Johnson, which you can find on the website. You know, I didn't know Eileen Johnson. I couldn't find as much detail about her as I could say, find out about uh, Herbert Zane and his family, which is another story for another time. And if you come to the exhibition um, uh, at the North Wall, then you will find out certainly more about that story but I could find out bits and pieces about Eileen Johnson. And so the rest became a kind of, well, faction, a fusion of fact and fiction. And that's the place, that's the path that I, I walk as a creative and did so within this residency. But it also just to, um, I'd love to bring Stella in here. And I know I'm totally mindful of time and that we're running a little bit over but Stella is also Stella mentioned spirits and and uh, kind of ghost energies and I know that's really important to Stella's practice so I, I want to just kind of give Stella a chance to respond are you on silence Stella um Rosa how long two minutes <laughs> yeah two minutes <laughs> okay checking in okay okay so um I was really, really blessed to have a, a mentor called Geraldine, Dr. Geraldine Connor, whose um, parents were very iconic uh, in Trinidad uh, and in England. Uh, Pearl O'Connor was one of the first uh, artists to open, to, to, to establish um, a drama school back in uh, 1946, I believe. Her father was Edric Connor. As one of the first black British actors to perform in a Hollywood film. So imagine that, imagine having a mentor with parents like that. <laughs> so my journey um, really did kick off when I, when I collaborated with Geraldine Connor and co-wrote some music for Carnival Messiah, which was a, a reinvention of Handel's Messiah. We went to Trinidad, I ended up living there for 15 years on and off. And I was exposed to um, Orisha culture, which is in Cuba, it's Santeria, and in Brazil, it's Candomblé. And it derives from West Africa, from the Yoruba tribe, where they salute um, almost like lesser gods. I don't like saying lesser, but they're like um, spirit guides. It's almost, if you look at Greek mythology and you look at all the, the gods there, and there are, there are parallels, but um, each, each spirit has, they, they kind of, you can align them with, um, the energies are like elements of water with fire with wind and um, if you turn that into music it's a whole new world <laughs> so I think for me when I'm when I'm um, I was really interested in this whole weaving of um, looking at how Africa has influenced the music of the West looking at this the, the similarities between my my Greek Cypriot heritage looking at the music of India and how it's influenced Cyprus and Turkey and you know looking at those connections so I've always been into just saluting the root I guess you know and I think we as um we as people we can always I think music is is, is it's a universal language and you can hear elements of music from all over the world in modern music today so I think for me I think spirit is, it's really important to, to, to be able to connect with the spirit of music and especially with the music that I've um, identified from Africa and how I relate it to how I practice my music today. I mean, there's a lot to say. I'm trying to wrap it up now. But um, yeah, sp spirit is, it's, it's essential for me. Yeah. Thanks. Did I do that in two minutes, Rosa? <laughs> Thank you. I always have this job of like keeping people to time or cutting, you know, or like waving fingers. So I'm really sorry. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you. And um, yes, I I am very mindful that perhaps people have other meetings or need a break and then want to come back. Um, so thank you so much to everyone for your questions, for being in the space. 
um, for joining us. And yeah, I, I just have to say thank you. There is there is um, a lot. I think we'll, we'll offer an opportunity for people to feed back to us um, and, you know, find ways to weave in your feelings or what's emerged from you for you into um, the project and into kind of continuing this conversation um, because, it, oh, I think there is a lot um, that can be, yeah, we could talk for hours. So thank you so much to everyone. I would love to end um, with a song from Cristela, if that's all right. Um, and we will leave the Zoom open. So feel free to go um, have a snack and then come back for the workshop. Um, and it will be the same Zoom link and Zoom chats. But if you can't join us, thank you so much for coming. And we will be in touch. Thank you. And over to Cristela. Thank you, Rosa. Every day I get a little bit stronger, climb my high, I get a little bit taller. Through experience, I get a little wiser. Walk and talk, my talk, I get more spiritual. Every day I get a little bit stronger. Climb my high, I get a little bit taller. Through experience, I get a little wiser. Walk and talk, my talk, I get more spiritual. And I don't feel to cry. It's so overwhelming what I feel inside. This is my lifeline Forget the virtual, three-dimensional This is real, real, I can really feel, feel, feel me yeah, yeah. my head high. I give thanks for my breath and that I'm still alive. There ain't nothing greater than to see my child smile. What makes us come back to root is when we nearly die. Life, make the most of it. Life, drink a toast to it. Salute and I'll be read. Will you be here tomorrow? Do you know the time that we do? You know the hour? No, you don't. Make the most of it. Life, Drink a toast to it, salute and I'll be read. Will you be here tomorrow? Do you know the time? Do you, do you know the hour? No, you don't. No, you don't. Because I ain't going back to the person I used to be. Now that I'm ashamed because it had to be. Who I am today, my past paved my way Life I am going back to how I used to breathe Not that I wasted my energy Who I am today is from my history I stand in my belief, it's my life Now and do you know the hour? No, you don't. No one else is like but mine. No one else is like but mine. No one else is like but mine. But no one else is like but mine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cristela. Thank you.